Tossing Grenades at Windmills Podcast. Welcome to the Tossing Grenades at Windmills Podcast. I am Tom Ricks, and I have here with me Josie bergen Lawson, who is my mother, and this is part of a series that we've been doing for quite a while called Momeries, or the Autobiography of Josie bergen Lawson, who is the person who I'm talking to. Um... And we last left uh, with uh, chaos and mayhem and darkness in Denver and uh, the high stress ray of light that is her husband is about to enter the scene. So um, why don't you tell me about all that? Okay. Uh I mean, I can give you the, I can give you the background about what caused you, me to ask you for a ride to Sage if you want. But, okay, you know, is that where we're starting? Your, uh, okay, <laughs> it's it's your autobiography. We can we, we we can we can go back in time to the primordial age and talk about the the jellyfish you think you might have been reincarnated at sixty million years ago. But I really don't think that the audience is going to no, want that. No, that's not so. what I'm asking. I'm asking where we stopped. Oh yeah, I, I vaguely recall that we stopped. I believe I believe we stopped with. Um, he who shall not be named and walden books that's correct we ended we ended with a, a series of awful jobs you had trying to keep food on the table right okay all right well um yeah so um at this point <laughs> at this point um i was had um moved out of the apartment let's see what happened i don't remember what i talked about but we i had moved out of the apartment that joel and i had lived in um joel had moved out you you kids came and went and i know we talked about the uh potato masher and so on um <laughs> um Let's see, I moved back in, we talked about me moving back in with your father and how all of that went. Um, and so after I moved out again, I moved out into an apartment in, uh, um, and actually Jill and I lived in a series of apartments that we never talked about that, but um, that doesn't matter, I guess. Um, but it was, um, Littleton Highlands Ranch area. Um, it was a pretty ratty apartment, but it was the right price, and it was sort of large enough for all of us. Um, your dad moved to Midland, I think, and and uh, you guys wanted to stay with me to finish high school. Did I talk? I talked about Christy, didn't I? I talked about the big fight. Yes, the bite, the biting, and all that happened. Okay, because yes. that happened like, at the like, second apartment. I lived in that first apartment, and then that guy had some problems. So the the guy who was renting that apartment had some problems, and we rented a different apartment. Um, Yes, we spoke about that. Um, but actually, when I was in the, when we were all in the first apartment, um, the first ratty apartment, that's when Skip and I met and we started dating and everything. And you had been going to a um, gaming club in Louisville. I always want to say Louisville. Louisville, Colorado. Um called sage i can't ever remember what the letters stood for um s i never would in a million years S A. it's called sage s-a-i-g-e and i can't remember what the initials stood for but skip apparently came up with it um <clears throat> anyway you had been going to that and at the time you didn't drive so uh you needed a ride to get up there because it was like an hour and 15 minutes from our house anyway um so it was a long drive and you uh asked me for a ride uh and at the time that's when i was going through the hell with as you say he who shall not be named um and uh i had no friends because the same thing happened with him that happened with your father 
uh, I didn't have any friends outside of their social circle. Um, so, um, actually that's not entirely true because I had some theater friends by that time. So I had my wonderful friend Sue Leeser and uh, a few friends from Loretta Heights College and so on. Of course, by that time, I think I mentioned that, you know, the AIDS epidemic and a lot of my friends were dying. So, um, anyway, um, yeah, you asked for a ride to Sage and I thought, well, you know, gamers are interesting, intelligent, fun people. So sure, you know, I'll drive you to, to, uh, this gaming club and, uh, hang out. Um, and so I drove you there and we walked in the door and you were interesting int introducing me to the president of the club, Ken Richard. And uh, while we were there, a voice behind me said, hey, I'm Skip, who the hell are you? <laughs> As I tell people over and over again, and I thought, uh, that's rude enough, I like it. So I turned around and introduced myself. Uh, later, Skip told me that, you know, I said, what did you notice as people will do after they've been dating a while or in a relationship a while, they'll say, what did you first notice about me? He said, to be honest, your ass, you're, you're facing Ken. And I just saw behind, everybody was sitting there saying, who is this person who just walked in? And uh, so Skip being Skip decided to just go ahead and ask. Everybody wanted to know. And so he asked. Um, and that's kind of how he is. Um, um, but we, we hit it off really well. Um, but yeah, that's how he is. We, we went to, uh, in the early days, uh, when we were in Atlanta and we were at the Atlanta Shakespeare Tavern, as it was called then, um, there was a poster caught on fire. They had a candle too close to a post with a poster on it. And, <laughs> and everybody started screaming, which is ridiculous. Skip just marched over yanked it off the post and, and stomped on it to put the fire out. That pretty much explains Skip in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and Jeff Watkins made a big deal out of it and said, Get, bring this man a beer and blah, blah. This is a man who saved my theater. And for a long time, he referred to Skip that way. And then, then he didn't. Um, but... <clears throat> Anyway, yeah, the whole audience applauded and everything. It was like a big deal. It was like all he did was the common sense thing. Everybody else was screaming, and he just marched over. It was a simple solution, and he marched over and took care of it. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, we hit it off. And uh, I went to Sage with you for uh, a couple of weeks, I guess. And then... Um, uh, you know, there was a woman that Ken was dating who was very weird and crazy. And that whole relationship was weird and crazy. But I won't get into that because that's not my story. But anyway, uh, but she said that... Literally, Dame not appearing in this podcast. Right. But um, anyway... Um, uh, she She told me that Skip was an asshole. And me being me, I just didn't say anything. I just kind of went, hmm, you know, and thought, well, so far I like him, you know. Um, he didn't seem like an asshole to me, and I have known lots of assholes. So um, <laughs> um, at some point, you know, we, I got to know everybody. Everybody was really friendly, and I got along with them really well. And um, um, eventually... I remember we had, uh, Ken had a Halloween party and, uh, <clears throat> I don't remember, that's not the one where I dressed as a Mouseketeer, was it? Lynette Funicello? I don't think it was. I think it was the next one. Mm -hmm. Ken used to have these wonderful, um, costume parties for his birthday. I, I, I do vaguely remember that, but I'm sorry, I don't remember the costume. Yeah, I don't either. But I remember Skip at the first, actually, maybe it was just Halloween, but he was dressed as a newscaster. So he was wearing his hair slicked back like a newscaster and a uh, suit jacket, tie, dress shirt, and shorts. 
because the joke is that <laughs> newscasters, <laughs> you know, you can't see what they're wearing right. below the table. So, um, you know, that's that's the running joke. So, um, and I, it made me laugh. And I think that night I asked him out. Um, and I, I, I gave him my phone number and I asked him out and, um, I don't remember exactly what happened. He might remember it better than I do, probably does. But um, he ended up taking me out instead of me taking him out because that's how he is. And uh, <clears throat> let's see, he took me to a Greek restaurant. <gasps> ah! What was that? Okay, Rags is attacking Goldie, and now Lulu's attacking Goldie, Skip. No attacking Goldie. Are you... Anyway. Oh, no. Interrupt our program, for these are the days of our pets. <laughs> anyway, um, where was I? Um, oh, yeah, he took me to a restaurant in downtown Boulder. Um, it was wonderful. It was a very high-end Greek restaurant. Wonderful food. Uh, they had belly dancers who were awesome. They had a small... Um, I don't want to call them a band, but they were, you know, a group of mus musicians playing. And it was just really fun. It was just a really fun, fun place, fun date. Um, and uh, then afterwards, we, you know, went on a walk um, through downtown Boulder, holding hands and just talking. And uh, I, I have this issue that I think I've mentioned earlier where... Um, boys, men used to make me nervous, and when I became nervous, I'd get become flatulent. And uh, so we're walking down the streets of down a, a street in downtown Boulder at night after we've had dinner, and it's dark out, and uh, I let this massive, massive fart out. To me, it seemed like it echoed down the street, and I was so embarrassed, and he said, well, I guess that means you're comfortable with me. <laughs> <laughs> so pretty much everything he did was just right. Basically, what he did is he was very accepting of me, um, <clears throat> and... Uh, yeah, he was he was hilarious when we first started dating. We'd go out for coffee or dinner or something, and and uh, he reminded me of Carl Sagan because he'd wear these suit jackets with these turtlenecks, and he would lean over in this sort of, you know, like with one elbow on one knee and the hand on the other knee, and he's leaning over, and and I just was very tickled by it because he was so uncomfortable he was obviously uncomfortable uh he was trying really hard to relax but he couldn't and um and i just he, it was very endearing um i liked the way he thought you know we had wonderful discussions about everything um <clears throat> at the time i think i mentioned that i had dropped out of theater because um i was working working too much and trying to focus what time I had left on my kids which didn't work as we discussed last time um, right and uh, so I wasn't doing theater at the time before I go on to that I have to mention the the, the first Highlands Ranch apartment I had uh, Julie and Jenny visiting from Midland Texas and so I had all, all the all the kids were there. I don't think you and Greg were on missions yet. And that's right, because you didn't leave for your missions until we moved into that next apartment. And um Well uh I mean I was in Augusta when I when I when I left. I technically I was in oh, okay. Houston for two months, but Yeah. But I think you, you know, were my, still my... you were still uh living with me. I think you lived with me for like a couple of days. Uh, you lived with me for a little while in that second apartment. While well, you had met Skip. 
Yes, not very long. Uh, you you met Skip in, if I recall, sometime between uh, April and June of 1990. Actually, and I was there we started much. dating in March of uh, 1990. 90. Yeah, that was because I remember very clearly because it was the year I graduated high school. And then I left in August. I, so I was there for most of the summer. And then, and yeah. then went straight. That and, sounds and then went right. straight. And then went straight to uh, Augusta and started school. Yeah, that sounds right. So, um, anyway, um, but we're in that first apartment, and all three girls were there, and we were watching. I don't remember what. Well, first off, I mentioned you know Skip was riding a motorcycle at the time, and um, you know I mentioned the you know they wanted to meet my boyfriend and. I said, well, you know, he'll be riding a motorcycle and he kind of styles his hair so that it's kind of spiky. And um, and he did at the time. And uh, Jenny stood by the window the entire time watching for him. And the, the moment he pulled up, she said, Mom, I think he's here. There's a guy out there on a motorcycle with sticky uppy hair. <laughs> 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 and... Uh, um. So he came in and was hanging out with the family. I think we shocked him a lot. I don't know why he stayed with me, but I'm glad he did. Because uh, somehow we got on the conversation how, as a child, I could put my feet behind my neck. And by at that point, I still could do it. Put my feet behind my neck. And because, did I mention this? I had seen a, uh, not a chiropractor, a uh, contortionist on Captain Kangaroo, and I was fascinated by that when I was a kid, so I worked really hard until I could put my, cross my ankles behind my neck, and uh, one of the older neighborhood boys, it, it became a routine for me to do that, and him to take me by the hands and swing me around, and all the neighborhood kids were amazed by that. It was my, it was my <laughs> big, big trick. Anyway, so we were talking about that, and then Christy, Julie, Jenny, and I all got down on the floor and started putting our feet behind her. I mean, we put him to the test. We really did. <laughs> but yeah, here's all four of us on the floor putting our feet behind our necks, and there's Skip watching us going, <laughs> well, this is an interesting family. <laughs> And then he told me later, did I tell you about the bathing suit? Because that subdivision had a swimming pool. Uh, this is by the time we were living in the second apartment, because it was summer by then. And um, so the pool was open, and apparently my bathing suit was sold, and I didn't realize because, it, you know, it's nylon or whatever, and then they weave other fibers in the nylon mesh. And I did not realize that the butt of my bathing suit had worn so thin that all that was left was the nylon mesh. So it was a, I, you know, I didn't, I don't put on my bathing suit and then look at myself in the mirror, you know, <laughs> I just put on my bathing suit and go swimming. And, and, uh, <laughs> and he mentioned that to me. And how shocked he was, and he thought that really was an appropriate bathing suit for a mother of, you know, six children. <laughs> and I was like, I didn't know! I had no idea! <laughs> so, I got another bathing suit and got rid of that one. <laughs> but, yeah, we put him through some shocks. Lesson, lesson learned. Uh-huh. That was also uh, the place we were living when that horrible, uh, the, is it 17 year cicadas or something? The, it's these cicadas that only come out for a few months every like decade and a half or something. I can't remember what kind of cicada, but they came uh, out. I, 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 I vaguely recall hearing about them, but I have no idea what this. Okay, was. well, I tell you what, that was a freaking nightmare because. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Um, they were just like balls of dust and they were everywhere. You would find them all over the freaking house. They were just everywhere. They would get into the house. They would get into the car. They would get, and if you tried to sweep them up or hit them with a broom, they just exploded into dust. It was, they were horrible and they were everywhere. It was like a, like a plague. 
Um, and yeah, I remember him. Uh, I, I think he spent the night one night, not with me specific, but he spent the night at the apartment or something. But the next morning he got up and started his motorcycle and a bunch of them had been hiding in the exhaust from his motorcycle and when he started his motorcycle it just blew out all these all these cicadas and all the dust it was awful um it sounds like it yeah it sounds like this probably happened after i was gone it, that may yeah, be sounds... that may be um but anyway um let's see what else um yeah and he didn't he didn't want children and I certainly didn't want any more children. Um, neither of us saw any reason to get married. Uh, I had already been through the fall to roll of a temple wedding and all that stuff. And, it, you know, it was not, none of that was rewarding. Nothing about that experience was rewarding for me. So I didn't feel a need to go through a big formal wedding again. Um, and reception and all that crap. So... Um, but he wanted to give it a year. He wanted to give the relationship a year. And we both had horrible, horrible experiences with dating. Both of us had had experiences with people you date and then they just disappear on you. Um, he, I think he referred to his situation as the amazing disappearing woman. You know, they'd be dating and then she'd be gone. You could never, you know, get a hold of her again. Um, <clears throat> so we both had bad experiences, so we were dancing around each other pretty carefully for about a year. Um, and then, um, about a year after we started dating, we moved in together. Um, just common law, according to the laws of the state of Colorado, you know, as long as you have, um, property in common and a checking account account in common and all of that kind of thing. Um, then as far as they're considered, you're considered, you're legally married according to the laws of the state of Colorado. And of, of course, up until, um, <clears throat> I don't remember what the, the, it was only like 500 years ago or something that they started coming up with public licensed marriage um, to keep priests from marrying because common law was the most common form of marriage. People would just move in together. They couldn't afford these big showy crazy things that people do. Um, they would just move in together and they were considered legally married, especially if they started having children and stuff. So, um, <clears throat> And a lot of priests, uh, up until about uh, 1500 A.C.E., um, would, you know, it was recommended that priests not marry. They didn't want them to marry, blah, blah, blah. That was the feeling of the, the uh, Catholic Church at the time and uh, the Christian Church at the time. But priests would go off and form common law marriages and because they didn't believe in divorce, you know, the church had a conundrum. So they started instituting public licensed marriage, etc., to control, <laughs> to keep priests from marrying, basically. Uh, so now we think of marriage as this whole thing that hasn't been around for that long. Most of humanity has never done the kind of what we think of of his marriage. Uh, that was only for wealthy people, you know, who were marrying for political and economic reasons, not because of love. Um, you know, it just, it's the history of marriage and sex and all that stuff is fascinating and ridiculous. Anyway, so that's how we were married. Um, we moved in together August, I think it's 27. <laughs> I can never remember the date. Uh, it's on the calendar, and we celebrate it every year, and we just celebrated our 30th. We wanted to be able to go to Boulder and hang out with everybody where it all started um, last summer, but we couldn't do that because of stupid freaking co uh, COVID, so that's ruined a lot of I stuff. I understand. So, um, <clears throat> it has indeed. Anyway, um, 
So yeah, so we moved in together into an apartment in Gun Barrel. Um, and Gun Barrel, which is, um, I, I don't know how far it is from Boulder and Louisville, but we, you know, we kept hanging out with our friends at Sage and stuff. And, oh, I didn't talk about, uh, yeah, I, I mentioned that I had stopped doing theater and I mentioned that, you know, because I was trying to impress him, I said I was an actress and he was like, well, I want to see you on stage. And I'm like, well, I'm not on stage right now. So, um, and then finally I decided, okay, every guy I've ever, and I told him every guy I, who has ever said that to me, the minute I start a play or whatever, they're like, you love theater more than me. And they get really angry and controlling and upset. And, um, Skip kept saying, you know, I want to see you on stage. I want to see you on stage. So I thought, okay, I'm going to call you on this. And, uh, so I auditioned for Quilters, <clears throat> which was directed at, I think the, um, Arvada Center and, and no, it wasn't the Arvada Center. It was a different, different place. I can't remember which theater company it was. It was a small theater company. And I don't think I've ever heard this story. Oh, Interesting. Small Sorry, please continue. Company in Colorado. I don't remember what the name of it was. And um, Bev Newcomb, who had directed me, uh, me and Sue, my dear friend Sue Leeser, we became friends for life after doing Brighton Beach memoirs at the Jewish Civic Center in um, Denver. Did I did I tell you about that? About you did not. How we, I do know so Sue Lisa oh, and how you I have to tell this story she, because it's that, hilarious. This was not too long after my divorce, and I was incredibly vulnerable and shy and uh, just, you know, recovering from a lot of stuff emotionally and mentally. And I, I did, um, I played one of the sisters. I played Blanche in Brighton Beach Memoirs, and Sue Lisa played Kate. And Bev Newcomb directed, and uh, it was that that whole thing was an awesome experience. We did it for the Jewish uh, Community Center there in Denver. Uh, it was an excellent, excellent production that was sold out every freaking night, enormously popular because we had an amazing um, Eugene. The kid who played Eugene was like really young, but gosh, his instincts were so spot on. He was so smart. He was like a tiny little Woody Allen without the perversions. Um, <laughs> and uh, he was so good. He was just so good. His timing was spot on and everything. He was so good. Anyway, so we're in rehearsal and the, the stage was made, the set was made so that it could fold up because we had planned on cutting the play down and taking it to a regional regional theater competition that was supposed to take place in uh it took place in uh laramie wyoming and then we went to a bigger competition that happened in oklahoma um so the set had to be portable so it was made from the beginning to be folded up and transported and um so when you were inside other rooms of the house that wasn't the main room um you had to stay back there because people could see you coming and going because it was a very compact set and there were large spaces of set on a uh, uh, stage on either side of the set and um there were a couple of long spaces where Sue and I were trapped back there. And Sue is a genuinely loving, extroverted person who loves just about everybody and wants to know all about them and everything else. She's an awesome human being. We were complete opposites. And we're back there. And she says, so, um, are you married? Well, I'm divorced. Uh, and she's asking me all these questions and where are you from and everything else and finally she says do you have any children and I said yes I have six children and she stopped and she said you have six kids and at this time the set wasn't up there we were just sitting up on a bench representing the set so that we could get used to the idea of staying back there for these portions where we're not on stage so we're up on stage on this bench and she turns to Bev Newcomb and she yells she we're in the middle of rehearsal <laughs> 
This is why I love Skip so much. Go away. Skip. <laughs> Go away. Go away. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway. This commercial interruption brought to you by dogs. <laughs> Man's best friend. So. Buy a dog today. <laughs> so, um, anyway. So we're up there. She looks out in the audience in the middle of rehearsal and yells, Bev! Josie has six, or at the time I was Jody. I, I went by Josie when I was 37. I changed my name. I decided, to, you know, I, I never liked being called Jody. I've changed. I wouldn't mind going back to Jody now, but that's life. I was Jody, and she, she, Bev, Jody has six kids. And it got real quiet, and Bev said, You dropped six kids? <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to crawl under the stage and hide. Yes, and I wanted to crawl under the stage boards and hide and die. I was so embarrassed. I was so embarrassed. Uh, but we ended up becoming really, really, really good friends um, to this day. Um, but, you know, that was... That was, and that was like one of the first things I did out of college. So that was like 96, somewhere in there. <clears throat> and, uh. You mean 86? 86, thank you. Uh, 86. And then, um. So jumping back to the early 90s and dating Skip, he kept saying, I want to see you. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. I'm morally obliged to do this. Cue person of interest, time sliding graphic forward by four years <laughs> and then focus in on the closed camera footage. Anyway, please continue. <laughs> anyway, so he kept saying he wanted to see me on stage and I thought, yeah, sure you do. And uh, so I auditioned uh, and got, a, got cast in the first thing I auditioned for. Um, in like five years, and or le I don't remember how long it was, two, three years, however long it was, I had stopped. And um, um, it was Quilters, which is a musical that rocked theaters all across Colorado. It was enormously popular there. I think it was popular in California. It bombed in New York really badly. New York just didn't get it because it's a very Western play about women women play all the roles it's a musical uh it's a folk musical and um it, it's about quilters and how quilts tell the story of a, the pieces in a quilt tell the story of a person's life um you know they and they would tell stories associated with these quilting blocks like Lone Star and, and, you know, Baby Block and other things like that. So these squares that go in a quilt. <clears throat> and um, it's, I think it's a beautiful play. Um, New York doesn't agree cool. with me. I don't care. Um, anyway, so I got in it and, uh, you know, I was gone at rehearsal all the time. And much to my delighted shock, um, he never said, you know, you know, you need to stop this or you love theater more than me or any of that other crap I used to get. He just said, I miss you, but I'm very excited for your, what, what you're doing and I can't wait to see you on stage. And once he saw me on stage, he was thrilled. And so were his, our friends at Sage. Um, and a lot of them came to see me in every friggin' thing I did there. Um, which was wonderful. I had this little support network that, you know, I wasn't used to having um, because they thought me being an actor was awesome. You know, Skip thought me being an actor was Yay! awesome. Yeah. So, um, yeah, um, I did Quilters. I did, um, I played Malin in um, Longmont, Colorado, uh, which is kind of a scary place. Um, it was a place where, you know, Mormons on the trail to Utah just stopped. They just stopped there and it became a town. Uh, but they were one of those towns that was extremely racist and had the uh, sundown laws where if you were black, you had to be out of town by sundown or, you, you know, you 
might be lynched. Um, it was a scary place, and it was still a scary place when I when I did this show. But the theater company was a nice little theater company. I got to play Malin and uh, Steel Magnolias, Steel Magnolias, <clears throat> and uh, Ken, who was the president of Sage, uh, was had ju juvenile diabetes, type one diabetes. So he was. Um, he loved it. He loved it. And he was so funny. He just gushed over me after he saw that play. And that play is one of those that you have. We had this during Native Gardens, too, where people come up to you and want to tell you their experience. For those not familiar, for, 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 sorry, for those not familiar, Native Gardens is the fabulous play that she was literally just in. Yes. And this time being uh, 19, uh, uh, November nineteenth, well, December eighteenth. I think we ran, or maybe it's uh, 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 yes of of twenty twenty one. Sorry. Anyway, yeah. please it's continue. The first play I had done since I did. Uh, I was in Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime in March. On March twelfth, we were have, supposed to have our first preview at the Pear Theater here, and well, it was in Mount. Yeah. Anyway, Native Gardens, which I just finished. Um, is a play that people come up to you afterwards and want to discuss their personal experiences and what uh, the play means to them and so on, which is kind of nice. It really is. It means you've affected people, and that's awesome. Um, and Steel Magnolias is that same kind of play. After Every night after the show, I guess some actors don't like, there's a thing, they do it especially here, I don't know about every other place, but um, where actors line up outside the theater and greet the audience as they're leaving um, in costume a lot of the time, and I personally like that. Um, you know, I did that playing Georgia O'Keeffe in Atlanta, uh, and people were shocked by that. It was a one-woman show, and I was so grateful to have anybody there reacting to what I was doing because we were in this big barn of a theater, and um, the fact that anybody came and reacted to what I was doing and enjoyed what I was doing, I wanted to go out and personally thank them for that. So um, anyway, I'm all over the place with this, but um, <clears throat> um, Steel Magnolias, you know, afterwards... People wanted to come up and talk to you about their experiences with somebody they loved who had juvenile diabetes, who died as a result of, you know, trying to have a baby or one thing or another. And uh, Ken was one of the people who came up afterwards, of course, because we were friends, but also because he was so moved by the whole story and related because of the story and the health issues related to type 1 diabetes that he'd been dealing with his whole life and that eventually killed him, which is sad. We lost him like four or five years ago. <clears throat> he was really very young, too young. Um, anyway, he wanted me to sign his friggin' <laughs> program because he was convinced I'm going to be famous someday. Um, and I was like, can you know me? No, I want you to see because someday you're going to be famous and I want to say I knew you when. Um, which is wonderful to have, you know, a friend respond that way. Um, let's see, what else did I do? I did, oh, um, Candide, I, which was awesome. I do remember. I played, um, that I did Candide, where I played a, a pink sheep at the Denver, it's the Denver Theater, Denver Civic Theater or something. I can't remember what it's called, but um, among other things, I played, I was in the chorus and I played like, 10 different roles but my favorite part was playing a pink sheep singing pink sheep um let's see what oh and uh the big thing was when i started working with the upstart crow the upstart crow um which was awesome we had moved by then we moved from gun barrel oh yeah while i was while we were living in gun barrel i started working for pfizer i i was i was doing um um temp work with uh, Olson Temporaries, and uh, I did a whole lot of different things, but the most interesting job I had while I was working with them was um, being a lab technician for Pfizer. So 
Pfizer then, uh, they do all kinds of things now, but then they produced these electronic scalpels. That's pretty much the only thing they produced. And Skip's mom uh, worked there at the time, Lynn. Um, I don't remember what department she was in, but, um, and she might have been part of why I got hired for that, but it was a six week contract. Uh, basically, I was the chief cook and bottle washer. You know, uh, I would, you know, uh, wash all of the Petri dishes and test tubes and everything they used. Oh, okay, I haven't said what it is. Okay, they produced these electronic scalpels and the lab department would take random samples from the scalpels that had been packaged and so on. So in order to see how clean the process is and whether they're sending, how, how contaminated the product they're sending out is, uh, they would bring samples back to the lab and uh, grow uh, bacteria from them to see if they were contaminated and if so, with what. Um, and my job, of course, was to just clean the equipment, uh, make the auto, uh, make the... Uh, medium in which the bacteria grew and so on and so forth. That was my job. Um, and I loved doing it. You know, use the autoclave to, to uh, sterilize things and so on. I loved doing it and I was really good at it and they loved me and I loved them and I asked, they were surprised because I asked all kinds of questions about what they were doing and why and they were not used to having anybody in that position who gave a crap. Um, but it was an awesome, awesome job, and I was there for six weeks, and they really wanted to hire me permanently, and I said, look, I'm an actor. The minute I get something that rehearses during the day, I'm out of here, you know, and you don't want that. You need somebody to be here, so, you know, I was perfectly upfront and honest with them, so I moved on to other things. Eventually, I started cleaning houses again, uh, this time in Boulder, but... Um, yeah, so when that was when I was working, when we were living in Gun Barrel, and then from Gun Barrel we moved uh, near downtown Boulder. We had a condo there uh, that we really loved. Uh, I loved that place. I would. <laughs> we had a pool outside, and when the when the pool was open, I'd go out in the morning and go out for a swim all by myself, just do laps in the pool. It was lovely. Um, just for exercise, you know. It was just a really wonderful place. It was right, the apartment we lived in was right by the start of the Boulder Boulder uh, 10K race that they have every year there. Uh, it's a, you know, international racers participate in that. So uh, international runners. Um, and the start of that race was just outside of our apartments. And we would sometimes go out and watch the start from, you know, go out to the front and watch it from there, or we would watch it on TV or, you know, whatever. But it was pretty, pretty awesome place to live. We were in within walking distance of the Pearl Street Mall. Um, we'd walk down there every weekend, you know, just for coffee and to pe people watch and stuff. And, and uh, excuse me, we'd go there on weekend evenings to watch buskers because a lot of the buskers from, like, the... Um, uh, Colorado Renaissance Festival and so on would would come and perform on on the Pearl Street Mall uh, for extra money. So it was just a really cool place to be. Um, and uh, oh, so I was saying um, Upstart Crow. When we moved there, I auditioned for the Upstart Crow and got into. Um, it was they were doing. Um, not Man and Superman. It's um, <laughs> the one that Man and Superman is a part of, and I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, um, ah, what's the name of the... No, it is Man and Superman. George Bernard Shaw's Man and Superman and the little play within it uh, that they would take apart is Don Juan in Hell. And so they would do... Man and Superman and alternate it with Don Juan and Helen on Sunday, they would do the whole shebang together, which was long. It was like three and a half hours long. 
and uh, my part, I played Mrs. I played Ms. Ramsden, uh, the sister of one of the, the main characters. And my job basically was to come in and be the voice of Victorian, the disapproving voice of Victorian England, uh, for like five or ten minutes. That's that was my part, and I loved it. I I loved it. I loved the people at Upstart Crow. They were awesome to work with. It was an awesome production, um, but. On Sundays, when it was three and a half hour production, because Miss Ramsden comes on fairly early in the show, um, and our condo was within walking distance of the theater, I would walk home, have dinner, walk back for curtain call, <laughs> <laughs> which was fun, you know. Um, I also did um, uh, Doctor. I did. Um, the tragical history of Dr. Faustus, um, Marlowe. Um, I, I got to play Mephistopheles in that, and that was awesome. I, Skip Skip was in it. He was actually in that, and he used to tell people that, you know, when I miss Josie too much, I I uh, try to audition for and get into whatever production she's working on so that we can spend time together. And uh, so we were together in... Uh, Faustus and we were together in Henry the Fourth Part One and I mean I never had anybody in my life react to this the way Skip did he was 100% supportive I mean I was finally at a time of my life where I could explore and grow and figure out who the hell I was um, and sometimes I you know I'm, I'm still not really pleasant to be around sometimes um, but you know he's just always kind of taken me as I am and, and let me grow and develop and learn and, and, and figure out who the hell I am instead of thinking me as an adjunct of his personality or something, you know, uh, a decoration on his arm or something. Um, yeah. Um, um, but yeah, Faustus was probably the most fun thing I did there. Oh, I also did Venus Observed. I played Jesse Dill and Venus Observed there. And yeah, I have seen the um, it, I have seen the videotape of you playing Faustus, and I agree that, that it, you as Mephistopheles was not only a turning point of your career, but arguably one of the top two or three parts you've ever done. You it, did it was, really, really well at that part. Thank role. you. It, it was a huge turning point for me because <clears throat> up until then, like a lot of actors playing an evil character. Um, I would get on stage and basically wink at the audience to let them know I'm not really like this. Uh, Mephistopheles was the first character I played where, you know, it was, and, and the best roles that I've had are the ones that I initially read and go, yeah, I don't know if I can do this. Um, and that was one of, of, one of those where I was like, eh, I don't know. And then you read it again and you go, well, maybe. And then you read it go and again and say, yeah, I can do this. And the big realization I had working on that show was we are all capable of anything. And I, I say that to some people and they give me shocked looks because they don't believe that. But the truth is we are all capable of anything depending on the circumstances. What makes you a responsible person or a not responsible person is realizing the fact that we are capable of everything and it's the choices that we make that make us who we are. So we choose not to be evil. We choose not to lie, cheat, and steal. We choose not to rape and murder. We choose not to abuse other people or animals. You know, that's those are the choices that... that make us responsible people um the people who are less responsible are the ones who don't th ever think about it and then you get in a circumstance where your daughter is raped and murdered and uh, suddenly you find yourself capable of murder you know because you've never thought about it before you've just never expended the energy you just assumed I will never murder, I will never do this, I will never make that choice until you're faced with a, a circumstance that makes that choice a lot harder. And as Skip put it, and I agree with him, he said, you know, today I will not kill, you know. 
it is a choice. It's a choice you make every day to be a responsible person and you look at each individual situation and you become aware that I am capable of anything. I choose not to, I, I choose to be a certain kind of person and therefore these choices, my moral gyroscope, my internal moral gyroscope leads me to make this more noble choices, you know, and we don't always succeed. I don't, certainly don't always succeed, uh, but we try. And that's what's important is we try to be good people. Um, so that realization helped me to jump into that character and play her sympathetically and honestly and apparently scarily because we were sold out every friggin' night. Um, people would come, and it's just really funny. I, I had the best time. That the director's, uh, Lori True's concept, the director was to have me on stage every night because her, her concept was that Mephistopheles is directing everything that's happening. So she's pulling all the strings. Um, so there were spaces on stage where... I didn't say anything, but I was there reacting to everything that was going on on stage. And sometimes I would just look out in the audience and look at people and think, yeah, I could torture that person this way. And I could, uh, you know, torture that person that way. And, you know, every so often an audience member would look up and see me looking at them, thinking that with that intention in my brain, and they would literally jump. And then... <laughs> And then they'd look away like, oh, I don't want her to see me, you know, <laughs> which was amazing. It was an amazing experience. Um, and I loved every, every second of it. It was, a, it was a huge step in my understanding of what I did as an actor and what I could do as part of telling the story honestly. And it actually served me playing Native Gardens, you know, because... People made the comment when I was doing that this last late November through December. Apparently one of the reviews said something about the racism just rolling off me, you know. And it's just because, because of those revelations, I was able to play that character honestly instead of pulling her punches. It's not fair to the playwright or to the audience to do that. It's not fair to the characters. It's not fair to the story. You have to play that character honestly. So that's what I did. I played her honestly. She honestly believed that she was in the right and the things she was saying and doing were justified. You know, anybody watching it is shocked. It's like reacting to those fools in, was it Mississippi, who... Black Lives Matter protesters were walking down the sidewalk by their house and they came out with their guns and were yelling, get off my property. They believe they're right. They believe they're right. Yep. And if you play a character like that and pull your punches, people just don't really see what's going on. People don't really understand the point the author is trying to make. And the author had some amazing points to make. And yes, both sides in the story are wrong about some things, right about some things, and um, have a lot to learn. But the truth is, the white people are living very privileged lives, and the Hispanic couple that moves in next to them teaches them some things they need to learn. And they've got a long way to go. But the good thing about the couple in the play is they're willing to listen and maybe inch along. It's not going to happen overnight. In a lot of ways, they represent the better part of white Republican America. You know, the people that really need to understand that you don't have to be a proud boy to still harbor racism and white privilege you know what i mean so um yeah anyway um 
But yeah, that was my lesson playing Mephistopheles, and it was an awesome lesson. And like I said, we were sold out every night, and Skip Skip was in it, and several of his friends came to see it several times. Um, he played, among other things, he played Sloth, and uh, because the, you have characters playing the Seven Deadly Sins, and those characters ended, entered from the back of the theater, and a couple of times we were uh, sold out to the point where some people were standing in the aisles, which supposedly they shouldn't be doing, but they were doing it anyway. And uh, he came in at one point and couldn't get through to get to the stage and do his bit, and there was a woman in front of him, and he gently touched her and moved her slightly, and she just about jumped out of her skin because audiences came to see that play because it was truly terrifying. It was a, a truly wonderful, terrifying, involving, engaging production. And uh, Lori did a brilliant job directing it, and we all had great fun doing it. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. So, um, but yeah, that was a huge breakthrough for me and, and had a lot to do with um, roles, difficult roles, and I had many of them after that. Um, and actually, Virginia from Native Gardens is, is uh, it's not as difficult as playing Mephistopheles or um, oh, the main character from Pterodactyls or something like that, but Grace Duncan. But, um, but it is not an easy role. And if you think it's an easy role, you don't understand what the play is about or what the character is about. So um, it requires commitment. So... Anyway, uh, now that I've babbled on about that. Um, You're fine. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, Boulder was a great experience. Um, and, you know, I still kind of kept my distance from Skip for a while. And it, it took me a while to realize how committed to me he was. And I finally accepted it. But it's after we, uh, one of the theaters that I worked for there was the Carousel Dinner Theater in Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, I did The Sound of Music. I played Yenta the Matchmaker in that. And then I played, um, um, oh, before that, I played The Abbess in uh, Sound of Music. I got really sick of that play. It's so it was, the music was so freaking saccharine. But anyway, um, yeah, and both of them ran for 12 weeks, which is a long run. And that's a dinner theater, so we were waiting tables in addition to being on stage, which was a great experience because um, you had to get into character real quick. You know, you didn't have an hour backstage to get focused before you went on stage to perform. You're out talking to patrons in regular clothes at, before the show starts. You're serving them, etc., etc., etc. You take dessert orders and stuff for intermission then you go back and you every second you've got backstage you're figuring out tabs uh you know how much people owe you and everything else and making sure that um you know what you're going to be doing during intermission and everything then you go on stage and perform and then during intermission you're you come out in costume and serve dessert and coffee and wine and mixed drinks and everything else and then at the end, you come out in costume and give them their tabs. Um, and so, you know, it was it was hard work, but it was some of the best paid work I'd ever had because of tips and stuff. Uh, and because you got a service, uh, in addition to your paycheck as an actor, you got paid your uh, uh, wage as a waiter and then on top of that, you got tips. So it actually ended up being pretty good money. I also did, um, funny thing happened on the way I played, um, ah, I can't remember her name. Uh, the female, the wife of uh, one of the main characters in um, uh, funny thing happened under uh, Domin Domina. I can't remember her name. Anyway, she's, She's a shrew. Um, 
I did that at Boulder Dinner Theater, which was the same thing. You wait tables and everything. That was a horrible, horrible, horrible experience. Um, let's see. And actually, that was before I met Skip. Did I mention that before? That was that was that was the director that screamed at me in front of everybody. Yeah, I talked about that last time. That's why I yes. dropped out. So that, that is. I, I'm yeah. I'm 71, so things blend together. You're fine. Anyway, yeah, you can cut all that out. Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it was it was good work. Uh, I met some good people doing that. They were good productions, uh, but they were 12 freaking weeks long, which you know. Um, and I can't remember which one it was I was doing. I think it was. Um, Fiddler on the Roof I was doing. One of them, uh, when I was doing that, um, it would take me an hour and a half to get to Fort Collins from Boulder. And then I would get up at 5.30 in the morning. Okay, it's when we were living in that first apartment because I remember showering in the morning and crying uh, because I was so exhausted. I was getting so little sleep. So I would... Um, drive to Fort Collins, do a show that's like, you know, five hours of all of that stuff, and it was exhausting work, drive home an hour and a half, and so I get to bed around two o'clock and then have to get up at like 4.30 or 5 because I was working as a roller skating hostess at the L.A. Diner in Boulder, um, Because, you know, extra money. And uh, this is one of the things when Christy moved to England, she didn't understand some things, but we'll talk about that later. Um, anyway, so I was exhausted because I wasn't getting enough sleep. Um, the roller skating hostess was a fun gig. Um and working the dinner theater was fun, but I was exhausted. I was working myself into the ground. Um, and like I said, I remember getting up in the morning and just standing in the shower and crying, you know, crying because I was so freaking tired. Um, I'm trying to remember. I think that was before, yeah, that was before, that was before Skip and I moved in together. So, um, now I'm confused on when certain things happened. Um, no, I, I don't think that's right. I don't think I was in the, the uh, Highlands Ranch apartment. I think I was in, in Boulder. Uh, but I was still working as a roller skating hostess at L.A. Diner and uh, was exhausted all the time. And... Um, um, Christy and her boyfriend then, John, just out of high school, they had graduated from high school. She was much happier once she graduated high school. High school was a miserable experience for her. And she at first lived in an apartment with friends. Um, and then she moved in with John, I think. And, um, Um, but she and John drove to Missouri. They were in Missouri. They were driving someplace to visit his family members or something. I don't remember why they were there. And there was a blizzard. It was blizzarding everywhere. It was blizzarding all over the place. It was blizzarding in Boulder, too, in Colorado. And, um... She and John hit a cow in his pickup truck because they couldn't see. And, of course, the cow died, and they totaled the truck, and they were stranded in this place in Missouri. And Christy called me, and Skip's reaction, again, this is just Skip, I said, what do we do? He said, we go get him, of course. So he got some sleep before I finished my show. Then after I finished my show that night and drove home from Fort Collins and we got in, uh, I think it was the Toyota Tercel we had then. 
and we drove to Missouri and got them. And not only that, but he took pictures of the car and everything for insurance and did everything to help them out with that. And we drove back. Now, the problem is, at the time, I didn't realize how sick I was with hypothyroid and pernicious anemia and folic acid and uh, iron deficiency anemia. I was really sick, but I didn't know it. And the, the whole time I'd been dating Skip, when I even before we moved in together, when I was still living in Highlands Ranch and driving to Boulder to visit him, uh, driving home, I would have trouble staying awake. There were lots uh, awake. There were lots of times when uh, I would wake up at the wheel, which was freaking terrifying. Um, you know, I would be driving, and the next thing I know, I'm waking up while I'm driving the car. Scary. Um, and the same thing was happening when, you know, we were driving back from Missouri with Christy and John. I could not stay awake, and he ended up having to drive most of the way because I couldn't stay awake, and I was afraid of killing us all. And again, blizzard conditions, uh, driving there and then driving home, we were in blizzard conditions the entire way. Um, and he, again, being Skip, I think he got to sleep at 5. He got up at 6 and went to work the next day. <laughs> oh. Yeah. That's Skip. So, yeah, when he makes a commitment, he makes a that, commitment. So, um, it's been about an hour. Do you, do you want to stop here? Do you want to, do you have any, do you want to keep going? No, we should stop here, but I just wanted to add one thing that before we moved in together, one reason he wanted to take a year before we moved in together was he had, had no children. I mean, I was 40 and he was 25 when we started dating. And um, he didn't have children. He didn't want children. He knew I had six children and he wanted to make sure he was willing to commit to my children before, before we moved in together. And most people don't give that kind of decision that much choice, that, mu that much thought. Um, he wanted to make damn sure that he was willing to be a good stepfather to you kids. And, and that was the decision that he had made when we moved in together. He made that commitment. And um, he's been a great stepdad and grandfather and everything else since because he made that commitment. He was going to be a father to my children. He wasn't just taking me on. He was taking on my children. How many men do that? A woman with six kids. This has been the Tossing Grenades at Windmills podcast. Buy my book, Have Name Will Travel, at Amazon and other markets. RedAnvilCreative.com contains all our podcasts. Copyright 2022! To fight the forces of evil!